the extent that there are causes of action and ways to get uh, redress for those violations, then um, as is true with any activity that you know has these human rights implications and violates the harder forms of international law, then I, I do think they should be accountable for those for those violations. It's the Lawfare Podcast. I'm Kevin Frazier, Assistant Professor at St. Thomas University College of Law and a Tarbell Fellow at Lawfare, joined by Professor Mark Chenin of Seattle University School of Law. You know, the concern is you're seeing a lot of fragmentation of AI governance, and that leads to, of course, conflicts and, you know, the spaghetti bowl of norms where there's inconsistent treatment, those kinds of things. Today, we're diving into the complex landscape of AI governance through the lens of international human rights law, drawing on Mark's extensive work in this field, including his recent articles in the Capco Institute Journal and Yale Divinity School's Reflections Magazine. Mark, when people think about AI regulation, there's no shortage of issues that come to mind. We know these camps about doomers and ethicists and We hear about Senate Bill 1047 in California and then all of these bills in Congress. And yet you're coming at this regulatory challenge from an international perspective, from an international law perspective. What is it about AI that you think lends itself to being governed at the international level as opposed to by the state or by national actors? Uh, well, first of all, uh, Kevin, thanks so much for allowing me to be a uh, part of this conversation. I-, I think it's fair to say that most of regulation is taking place at the nation state level or at the local level here, say, in the United States. Uh, but there is um, uh, an emerging what might be called a, a nascent form of governance of AI at the international level that is both purely and truly international and also um very much uh, transnational in its uh, scope and application. So that uh, what we're seeing happening in states like California and then in a course in countries and regions like the European Union are making their way uh, to the international level uh, so that the kinds of norms that are emerging at those lower levels are then uh, sort of crystallizing at the international level. And then, of course, will have their effects uh, at at that level of, of governance. Uh, it's also fair to say, though, that um, w- it's almost as if uh, artificial intelligence governance has a kind of fractal kind of geometry in the sense that obviously there are very uh, different layers of regulation from and governance starting from the, you know, the firm or individual locales. And then at, at here in the United States at the state level, the federal level, then making their way up to regional and then international levels. But within each level of governance, you see the same kinds of, uh, say, governance tools being used to address these uh, issues, as well as, uh, in in many cases, the same actors uh, that uh, particularly, say, the large uh, technology companies are actively involved in uh, governance at all of the levels I've just listed. And then you also see... um, Parts of civil society, like uh, not particularly non-governmental organizations who are starting to be active in all of these levels as well. And of course, at each level, governance has different nuances because of the nature of the level of governance. And at the international level, then we have to bump, we obviously bump up against international law itself, its, its strengths and its limitations, uh, the power of states, and, and of course, you know, geopolitical concerns. Uh, you know, clearly these have an influence on AI governance at, at that level. And to me, that makes it fascinating. And then, of course, uh, everyone acknowledges that uh, AI applications are poised to affect, you know, almost every major domain in human life. And many of those effects are going to be international in scope. Of course, they already are. So it really raises the need for governance at that level. Well, and I think what's staggering about your scholarship is pinpointing that international human rights law is not just, oh, what is the UN doing, right? There are so many different bodies of international law upon which we can look at potential regulations of AI. And so, for example, you've pointed out that 
under Article 2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there may be concerns about a lack of transparency around automated decision-making. You've also pointed out concerns under the EU uh, Agency for Fundamental Rights, what concerns it's pointed out under the Charter for Fundamental Rights of the EU. Can you walk through some more examples of the conflicts between different AI applications and some of these international or regional or transnational human rights documents? So uh, just to give um, uh, listeners a a kind of framework uh, for this conversation, uh, we should know that when we talk about human rights, there are several aspects of it as they apply at the international level. Uh, One is uh, just uh, human rights as a set of principles about how we should uh, treat human beings. And uh, that is part of the conversation that's taking place at that level. And then uh, we have, you know, the international rights as rights, uh, legal rights, very similar to those that we're familiar with here at the domestic level. And then, uh, as Kevin, you're referring to, there is the body of treaties or the body of rights that are that are codified in uh, what are now numerous uh, international human rights uh, treaties. Uh, and you've mentioned some of that, and you mentioned one of them. And then finally, um, human rights can be understood as the, the practices and institutions that now exist at the international and regional level uh, that uh, enforce and further those, those rights at, at that level. Now, when uh, you're referring to, you know, these specific rights, uh, that is certainly part of now the work of human rights at the international level as it applies to artificial intelligence. So you've listed articles related to the rights to participate in, in government. And I'll, I'll just elaborate a little bit more on that. The, the, current, the concern really is that um, as artificial intelligence is being used at the governmental level to provide governmental services or to adjudicate disputes in regulation of welfare benefits, for example, uh, the concern is that uh, the algorithmic decision making will lead to impacts, you know, adverse impacts on humans uh, that are recipients of these um, of these kinds of benefits or government services, and leaving very little recourse to these recipients if they receive adverse decisions. And so, the concern at uh, at a human rights level is whether that detracts from uh, a person's ability, right, to participate and also to interact with with their government. And that certainly will occur and and does occur uh, with rights to participate, say, in in elections, those kinds of things. Um, You've asked for other examples. Uh, One that is frequently raised is our rights to privacy that are embodied in several uh, international human rights documents. And uh, there, uh, the the concerns are obvious that particularly with uh, certain kinds of artificial intelligence applications, you know, inadvertent disclosures of private information can occur, or there's even, and there's also concerns about the kinds of uh, computer human interactions where uh, people might be, because of, you know, the nature of these interactions uh, might uh, disclose um, private information, which will then, you know, then as it were leak out so that, uh, again, these rights to privacy are implicated. Then uh, there is the, the right to life. And that, you know, obviously, that's a very broad uh, right that has several facets, and you know, we can begin to talk about things like things related to uh, autonomous, lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, then there are rights to um, due process that are, are embodied in many uh, human rights documents. I've already mentioned, uh, you know, concerns about um, algorithmic adjudication or the uses of of AI. Uh, in the adjudicative process, there are real concerns that w- when it comes to law enforcement about, say, for example, predictive analytics being used to, uh, you know, being used in connection with, say, um, with bail decisions or parole decisions. All of those, uh, you know, observers are very concerned that if there's a uh, over reliance on those applications, that uh, people's human rights in those areas are going to be violated. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, which is excellent. And I guess one place to start would be your initial dive into various conceptions of human rights and how it can be thought of and actualized in different forms. And I think a common critique of human rights is that it is too mushy. 
it is too amorphous, especially with something in need of such specific and tangible regulation as AI. Is your goal, or do you think the the important role for international human rights law to play setting broad principles or becoming the sort of hard law that we actually hold companies accountable to? I, I see it as a, a combination. Um, and by the way, you're quite correct to say that uh, international human rights and human rights generally is subject to much criticism. Uh, as you say, one reason, because they can be considered amorphous, particularly when you talk about them at the principal level. And then we can uh, you know, talk about the extent to which states really comply and conform to human rights uh, norms as well. And there is also the critique that uh, it, you know, they purport to be universalistic, right? Universal in application. And so there's real pushback sometimes about that uh, because that's sometimes very hard to justify. Often uh, human rights are criticized as being a product of Western culture and then imposed um, upon other parts of the world. Now, to get to your, your point, my sense is international human rights should serve as the sort of overarching you know, articulation of human values and the source of, I don't know, the goals to, to which AI governance is aimed. So it, you're quite right to say that specific human rights norms might not have a direct impact on the way in which, you know, on, on particular AI applications, the way they're structured, how training occurs, all of those kinds of things. But in my view, they should serve as the source of the more specific norms that are going to have a direct application on artificial intelligence. So by and large, I do see them more as a set of principles, at the, but at the same time, you know, international human rights do have that harder legal edge to them. And states have agreed uh, to comply with them. And there are mechanisms in place to enforce them. And uh, there are and will be, in my view, instances when artificial intelligence applications are going to lead to the violation of those harder rights. And to the extent that there are causes of action and ways to get uh, redress for those violations, then um, as is true with any activity, that you know has these human rights implications and violates the harder forms of international law, then I, I do think they should be accountable for those for those violations. Thinking through that as well, you've mentioned quite frequently the nation state as the unit around which international law is centered. And so when we think about companies, companies like OpenAI who have a model that is used globally and who have employees globally and data globally, what is the method of actually taking these principles and ensuring their application to companies, companies that exist in some states and operate in in many more nation states? Uh, so that's that's one level of analysis that I'd love to dive into. And relatedly, is there a sort of, not to be too cynical, but are we seeing more kind of cheerleading among AI labs, maybe for international governance, and I'm using air quotes there, out of mm-hmm. the expectation that it's a little bit harder to actually have teeth to those international norms and principles rather than something as specific and hard as, let's say, a domestic law passed by Congress, for example. Uh, those are very good points, Kevin. Uh, you're quite right to say that um, one of the major, might as well call it a major weakness of the international system at this point in connection with human rights uh, as it applies to AI is that uh, international human rights do not apply directly to private entities. Uh, That law applies only to nation states and to some extent in rare circumstances to individuals so that any um, norms that international norms that affect business activity by and large have to then be enacted into law at the nation state level in order for those international norms to have any application. Now, now it is the case, though, that nation states have entered into treaties, say, for example, with regard to uh, corruption and bribery that do have a direct impact on uh, business activity and, you know, have been enacted into law at the nation, at the national level. So it, it, it isn't the case that international law never has direct impact on, on businesses. 
but it's usually tough to have that happen because at the at that level, of course, you need the consensus of states. To respond, you know, to the other part of your question, I think that we can go in two directions. We probably should uh, try to flesh out both of these directions. One of them is that there are moves now at the regional level to take uh, the norms which do exist at the international level that apply to businesses, which include uh, the obligation of businesses to respect human rights, and uh, then to turn that principle and as were the components of that requirement and make them make them harder law so that we see that uh, in Europe in particular, moves which have made uh, one aspect of this respect for human rights, which is to engage in a full-bodied uh, human rights due diligence assessment. Uh, that has now become law at, you know, at the EU level with a, with this, with a, a directive that was passed this year. So you begin to see these international human rights norms as they apply to business starting to become harder law, not at the international level, but at the regional and perhaps at, and also at the nation state level too. So that's one area in which uh, international human rights are slowly beginning to have this more direct impact on uh, businesses, including uh, the large technology companies. The other half of your question, though, is you're quite right to say that uh, we have at the international level, and as I said earlier, at every level of governance, often the same actors that are, as it were, you know, jostling with and interacting with other actors as norms are being developed at each of these levels. And you are quite right to say that the larger technology companies I guess I, you know, I don't, I don't sit in those boardrooms and have those, or I'm not privy to those conversations. But as you say, Kevin, it, you can see a move where it would be easier to press for norms at the international level because uh, out of an expectation that they will have less bite, right, than those that are in place at the domestic levels. That certainly might be part of the strategy. Now, I will also say though, because uh, that kind of coordination and those norms are not being arrived at at the international level. Certainly, and here in the United States at the at the federal level as well. Then you know the concern is you're seeing a lot of fragmentation of AI governance, and that leads to of course conflicts and you know the spaghetti bowl of norms where there's inconsistent treatment, those kinds of things. So there there are some pr- pragmatic problems with governance at, at lower levels, but of course it has its advantages as well. I mean, there is a reason why say the European Union has adopted a concept of subsidiarity because out of a sense that, you know, most governance decisions, uh, you know, should be made at the lowest possible unit. And we could talk about why that's important for the legitimacy of those kinds of norms, as well as just for the pragmatics of, of achieving consensus. Yeah. And with that notion of subsidiarity, that makes me want to turn back to what you were mentioning about the biases we have seen historically in international human rights law. And I think an aspect of AI's development and adoption is the fact that different societies have very different willingnesses to accept and integrate AI into different aspects of their day-to-day lives. So I was speaking with a individual who has spent quite a bit of time in Zimbabwe and Vietnam, and she was telling me about uses of AI to detect TB. And to, to have a reliable means of detecting TB, that requires sharing quite a bit of sensitive personal information yes. with the government, which from a Western point of view, is is generally a faux pas of sorts, if not explicitly legally forbidden, it's harder to share that sort of PII with any entity in the West, I'd say, than perhaps in, in other nations. And yet there's this willingness there to say, oh, well, we, we want this more robust TB diagnosis mechanism. So that was a long foray into saying is it possible to have international principles for AI governance, given just how starkly different the adoption will look like in a place like Zimbabwe versus New Zealand or 
pick two spots on the map and we can see right. that AI adoption will probably look quite different and public willingness for that adoption will probably look quite different. I agree completely with you. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, as I think about international human rights, that's why I advocate them as a kind of a sense of overarching norms that inform this kind of AI governance that then, as it were, trickles down, or and at the same time, right, it's emerging from the from the bottom up, and they sort of meet in various uh, parts of this or various levels of governance. But I guess I would say this that we, we want that kind of particularity because, as you say, it might be that different countries have different kinds of understandings of privacy of, uh, and, and tolerances, right? And, and, and we certainly want that to happen because these countries, you know, have made our cultures make decisions about what is good for their societies. And I think we should, and obviously they should be honored. Um, at the same time, you know, virtually every country in the world has signed say, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and our uh, signatories to one of at least one of the two major human rights instruments that fall under that declaration. So a strong argument can be made that the international community as a whole has endorsed the, the rights that are embodied in those in those documents. Then what that at least at a minimum, in my view, that does is it provides us with language where we can have conversations about the way in which a particular country might view privacy, uh, as in your example in Zimbabwe, or we might have it or as per particularly in, in Europe or here in the United States, where we might have different understandings of what privacy protection means. But at least we've got, as I said earlier, this language where we can have that conversation and there will be differences of opinion over what constitutes a violation of privacy, what is protection of that privacy, et cetera. Uh, and then also, I just want to be quick to say there are some, I think, irrespective of the culture, uh, you know, actions and events, I think we would, that most of us would recognize as a violation of human rights. Now, even those sometimes are are contested, right? We, we can think about treatment of China's treatment in Xinjiang, for example, uh, I think most of us would say that human rights are being violated because of those actions. Obviously, China has a different view and has, you know, defended itself even through human rights language. Uh, but even in that situation where there's a uh, conflict, I think it still gives us grounds then, right, for criticizing what we view to be actions of other cultures. So it's it's kind of like a a tension, right, between this universalism, but allowing for the kind of particularity that you're describing with your examples. Well, and as you've pointed out in your scholarship, AI may be more amenable to international regulation in different ways, uh, depending on what sort of, what aspect of AI we're trying to govern. So for example, you've highlighted the regulation of supply chains with mm -hmm. respect to AI and human rights as potentially a, a really ripe area for the application of these human rights laws or norms. Can you detail why you think supply chains in particular may be a spot where we can kind of shine that human right lens on in, in specific detail? Well, what I'd say, Kevin, is that um, I, I don't know if I've advocated that this is an area, but it's a, where it sh sh I guess I would say that it's an area that is ripe for that kind of regulation uh, as well. But that also applies to businesses generally. So that uh, when we go back to um, when I discussed uh, the international norm of this requirement of businesses to respect human rights, the recent uh, directive, for example, adopted in the EU that requires large, large companies to engage in that kind of due diligence includes uh, due diligence over the participants in that supply chain. Uh, then as it applies to artificial intelligence, I think the, you know, the concerns are that we have uh, artificial intelligence applications being developed by, you know, large technology companies, but also startups as, as well. And it, and the real concerns are not so much about, well, there are obviously concerns about what's occurring at that level, but then we have to keep in mind that these applications are going to have uh, end users who will then deal with, say, customers and the public which will have these human rights implications and uh, effects. 
So uh, we're going to need, and this is what the EU is trying to do with uh, not just AI, well, with the Artificial Intelligence Act, to try to to have governance over over those kinds of impacts as well. So not just with the developer, say, of the technology, but also in the relationship with the users, et cetera. But well, I should also point out, Kevin, that um, at, within each firm, the larger ones in particular, you already see uh, that kind of governance occurring in the form of, say, end user, end user agreements that prohibit users from using the, te- the technology uh, in particular ways, uh, you know, obviously to, say, uh, infringe in t- on intellectual property, but you can easily see them prohibitions on on actions that are going to, say, harm someone's civil rights. So we're, we're seeing at sort of the firm level that kind, these kinds of norms, obviously they are not legal norms, but they're, uh, they're being practiced. And now they're rising to the level of legal norms, uh, particularly in Europe. So yes, I do see, uh, as, as do other observers, this room for yeah, governance over what happens to the technology once, it's, once it leaves the firm's hands. And of course, you know, in the current model, the, the technology firms that are developing this technology are going to continue to have control over the software, right? Because of the, uh, because it's, it's subject to leases, it's, et cetera. And you mentioned briefly, and in case listeners didn't catch it, the EU's corporate sustainability due diligence directive. Can you explain a little bit more about how that may apply to, to AI and what exactly that imposes on labs? So the the due diligence directive will apply to all companies, even those outside of the the European Union, that have um, for over four hundred fifty million euros of uh, turnover in the European Union, say two years prior to the, the, the time in which that's measured, and that will include uh, the large uh, technology companies based here in the United States, and uh, because of that, uh, they will be required to engage in a human rights due diligence, which means that uh, as they are developing products and services, uh, AI applications, uh, they will have to engage in this kind of broad assessment of the possible impacts of their technology on on human rights, uh, human rights as they are embodied in Europe, uh, but also incorporating uh, the, the, the um, human rights instruments that Kevin and I, and I were discussing uh, earlier in this talk. Uh, so not only must there be that kind of an assessment, there, there has to be uh, certain safeguards in, in place to, to ensure that those things, that those actions or those effects to the extent they occur are, are mitigated. Uh, there has to be this monitoring. Uh, there have to, there are going to be some reporting requirements about those possible impacts. Uh, and one of the, one of the major developments is that the members of the unit of the EU are going to, are, will have to, provide causes of action for victims of violations of uh, these of, of the act and also to the extent that um, say AI technology uh, damages cause damage because of violations of human rights uh, there needs to be a cause of action so that they can get redress it's a major development in um, international human rights as they apply to businesses it's really fascinating, and I think it's going to be something that hopefully a lot of people are, are keeping an eye on as we continue to see AI companies evolve both through sourcing compute, through sourcing sufficient energy, through sourcing expertise. I mean, there's just so many ramifications there. Switching gears just a little bit, I think you're you're one of the few scholars in the legal academy I've ever met who's published in the Yale Divinity School or with the Yale Divinity School. And in that article, you mention the aura of inevitability with respect to AI. And I was hoping you could dive into that a little bit more and, and why it matters with respect to AI governance efforts writ large. The, the notion of aura comes from uh, conceptions or the history of technology and the various conceptions of technology. So that uh, technology has often been viewed as inexorable. That you know there is this march of progress, or the the quest for knowledge, or even say, of course, mark and imperatives, which are continue to drive us right to to improve and develop technology. Uh, and there is that school of thought that says there is no no stopping it. Uh, there is also uh, an idea that technology is neutral, uh, 
that it has uh, good and bad uses. And so it's not so much our need to regulate technology, but it's more, you know, it's, uh, it's effects. And then uh, there is a notion that it, technology is actually a product of uh, political decisions that societies make that not, uh, that not only lead to technology being used for social control, but much broad, more broadly, again, is, you know, part and parcel, right, of the, of the community which en- enables that technology. But to go back to then to the R of inevitability, as you can see how easy, you know, easily plays into rhetoric that, well, you know, technology is, is, is developing faster than the law can ever, you know, keep up with. And, and to an extent, that's, that's true. But um, I, I think it also can be used as and also can be used to discourage people from even trying to address, uh, you know, the concerns that are raised by, say, uh, by artificial intelligence out of a sense that really there's not much that can be done because it's going to happen anyway. I think, though, you know, just given the history of the regulation of other technologies, such as uh, the automobile, every time that... Um, a new technology has emerged due to similar arguments that the law cannot catch up or keep up with these developments. Uh, and yet we have found a way. Um, and obviously it occurs slowly because of the nature of, of law. But at the end of the day, we do find, uh, you know, societal values embodied in law that then do have an impact on these technologies. And I, and I think that should be also true with uh, artificial intelligence. And in, in that vein, by the way, you, you might have heard of uh, Colin Ridge's uh, dilemma where he says that he, uh, that, you know, the problem with uh, regulating technology is that uh, when a technology is first emerging, it is, it, it's impossible to assess or predict all of the impacts, both good and bad, that it will have on a society. But by the time those uh, impacts are known, then it's uh, too late to to regulate, and and it is a real dilemma, and hence you know uh, irresolvable. But to the extent you can respond to those uh, to that dilemma, one is, and apparently this well, one approach is to try to get input as early in, as possible among all stakeholders as to what possible uh, impacts might occur. Uh, as this, this technology is being developed, acknowledging fully that no one, no one can predict the future. Uh, the reason why I think that's appropriate to this aura that surrounds, uh, that sometimes surrounds artificial intelligence is there are some attempts being made to get stakeholder and public input into sort of the development of some of these technologies, including AI. And, uh, I would like to encourage the public, encourage particularly those of us who are lawyers to, uh, to get involved to the extent we can in uh, those conversations and not be intimidated by, you know, the technical aura that surrounds artificial intelligence. Uh, it is the case that um, much of it is, you know, highly abstract or particularly for those of us who may, may not be mathematically inclined. I, I'm certainly one of them. Uh, to shy away from it. And of course, there is a sense that where experts sometimes are not open to hearing from lay people because of our lack of expertise. But on the, on the other hand, it's only members of a community or those of us in the public, we're the ones who are going to have uh, feel the brunt and the effects of that technology. And we also have more information about our own communities as well where uh, those voices uh, really should be heard. So to the extent that we can get involved in these kinds of earlier discussions, I wouldn't want that aura that surrounds AI to prevent us from getting involved. Well, and I think you raise a number of points, which is, especially when we look at prior efforts to regulate emerging technologies, we have we have found a way. The car didn't destroy humanity. Obviously, it's led to a lot of negatives, Indeed. Yeah, something that stands out, though, is I have yet to meet a person who says we got international law of right with respect to social media. And to close, I would be really interested in hearing what have you seen or what haven't you seen or maybe what would you like to see about AI international governance 
to improve upon what we saw in the social media era? What what lessons should we learn about the failures or successes about the application of international law and norms to social media in the AI context? Uh, I do think that they are closely related, Kevin. Uh, that social media and its regulation not something that I have a great deal of expertise on or knowledge about. Uh, but I, what I can say is, uh, again, at the at the international level, there are uh, working groups within various uh, international agencies that are looking uh, at exactly this: the relationship between AI and social media, and generative AI, etc. I don't think I would say this as something I want to see in place, but something that I applaud, I guess is a better way to put it, is the uh, opening up of those spaces to experts, to non-governmental organizations, to you know, engage at that, at, the, at that level and to express these kinds of concerns at the international level in terms of how uh, AI might be affecting folks just as uh, and social media affects us. The other, the other thing I'd say is that, of course, at that level, it is, it is highly abstract, right? And quite removed from sort of our daily experience. But again, this is uh, one of the, I think, one of the advantages of understanding governance at this sort of, as kind of this set of fractal geometry is that the kinds of, inputs that we make and have at this local level, for example, uh, can and do make their way up to the international level. And because of the internet and uh, the ability of say international organizations to open up room for comments, uh, that is certainly occurring in uh, at, at the United Nations level where the public can actually give comments to certain kinds of proposals that are being made there around the governance of AI. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to get involved not fully acknowledging, though, that by the time we reach that level, you know, we as individuals might have very little influence. And yet at the same time, I think it's important for us to be be involved. Yeah, I, I love that challenge. Yeah, it's like um, letters to the editor. I don't know sometimes how often how effective they may, might be, but um, it's yet it's still an opportunity to to get involved. And of course, then to support organizations and and maybe state initiatives here at, at the local level that, you know, someday might emerge as a norm that makes its way to the international level. Uh, and then, uh, you know, not to end on, a, on a, a pessimistic note, but we have to keep in mind that, you know, again, these actors are working at all levels. And so, and they are very powerful actors. But again, you know, the, the, the tools that have been used here, for example, around corporate governments in other, with regard to other human rights issues, say, for example, in the garment industry, all those things, uh, they do have an impact, right, on, on corporate wow. behavior. And uh, we could have a whole separate uh, conversation around uh, corporate governance and, you know, shareholder activism and, and other ways in which uh, companies have been and, and in a sense need to respond, right, to public concerns. Uh, and that certainly will include uh, artificial intelligence. Well, we may have to have you back to discuss just that. And But before I let you go, I do think I came across something that I think too few Americans know about, which is before we had Social Security, there was a gentleman, Dr. Townsend, who was just a, a average doctor who wrote an op-ed. And that op-ed created the Townsend Movement which was basically giving senior citizens $200. And the catch was they had to spend that $200 within the month. And that was going <laughs> to stimulate the economy uh, during the Great Depression. And that notion was yes. extreme and people uh, knew it was extreme, but it gave rise to the social security system we have today. And so to your point, if you share an idea, especially in a field that is as novel and as ripe for study as AI, you never know what's going to catch fire. Obviously, it's a little hard, a little hard to go viral these days. There's a lot of competition right. out there, but some idea might take hold. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you're issuing this challenge to the listeners. Well, that's a great illustration. Yeah, that that that, that makes me feel better. There we go. Well, on that note, thanks again for coming on, Mark. I think we'll go ahead and leave it there. Well, thank you very much, Kevin.
The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter through our website, lawfaremedia.org slash support. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Pacha, and your audio engineer this episode was Noam Osband of Goat Rodeo. Our theme song is from Alibi Music. As always, thank you for listening.